Three million people have visited the Imperial War Museum here at Salford Quays since it opened back in 2002. This year, thousands more of all ages will come here to learn about the First World War, a conflict which claimed 16 million lives and which touched virtually every UK community. The BBC has joined with the Imperial War Museums at Salford and in London to unearth more than a thousand new stories which link the places we live in today to the events of a century ago. We're going to show you just a few of them. Here's a taste of what's coming up. In response to the suggestion from the Dorset Education Committee, many of the older children have volunteered to collect acorns and horse chestnuts for the Royal Naval Cordite Factory at Holton Heath. These women were a long way from your archetypal, genteel, delicate Edwardian ladies. Hundred years ago, Lizzie was doing her bit for the war effort as much as any Sheffield person. This is where the miniature rifle range was, and this is where Carl Lodi was brought on the morning of his execution and executed by firing squad. On the 22nd of August 1914, this gun fired the first artillery rounds of the war near Mons in Belgium. As battles raged across the Channel, communities back home would find themselves in the front line all too soon, including the peaceful seaside town of Scarborough. One winter's day, German warships launched an unprovoked and shocking attack. Michelle Lyons of Look North takes up the story. On the day of the bombardment, my mother came here for Holy Communion at 8 o'clock in the morning. And during the communion service, the bombardment started and the church was one of the first to be hit. The intense shelling left a large hole in the roof of St Martin's on the Hill in Scarborough and as hundreds of visitors and residents fled the seaside town, one woman decided to stay as she had an important engagement to keep. My parents were to be married in the church later on and after the bombardment she went round and picked up a piece of shrapnel, which we still have, then had a discussion with the vicar and they decided that the wedding would go ahead. This attitude that life must go on prevailed in Scarborough and its tourism industry responded to the aftermath of the bombardment. Now people weren't coming to the seaside town for fresh air and fun, they were coming to survey the damage. It's difficult to imagine postcards of blown out buildings being produced and of course we had one of the major postcard producers in Scarborough and there were also sort of ceramic souvenirs. There's a lovely one that we have in our collection which is the lighthouse with a hole blown through it. Um, I've not seen many examples of that but that was obviously sold um, and there were pieces of shell that were not just circulated but were sold as well and they were mounted on blocks of wood and pieces of metal. And there's one legacy of the bombardment in Scarborough which is still attracting attention. Number two Wycombe Street. It was badly hit and mother and three of her children died as a result. This house may have a macabre history but people are still interested in its past. I've had quite a few people on a regular basis. Um, every year we seem to get somebody knocks and uh, ask, inquires, did I know anything about the house? And is, is it still, um, did I understand the pictures? And a lot of them actually even bring books and pictures with them and want to show me uh, what, what has actually gone on. It took years for the town to recover from the bombardment compensation for the damage was slow in coming so residents had to rally round and do the best they could with the little money they had but slowly and surely Scarborough made a comeback as the tourist destination we know and love today made famous by its beautiful views and not its ugly past 
On the home front, all sorts of people were lending a hand, including workers at a cordite factory in Dorset. A cordite was an explosive propellant used in all sorts of weapons, and because the Germans were attacking supply convoys, the British Army was running short. The answer lay literally on the ground, and the government enlisted children to help out. Former war correspondent Kate Aidy set out to investigate for BBC South. The Royal Navy was the most powerful in the world in 1914. This gun fired the first British shot in World War I. It's now in the Royal Navy's National Museum in Portsmouth. The need for munitions for this gun and millions of others led to enormous demands on the whole of the country. And a remote area of Holton Heath and Dorset became home to the Royal Navy's Cordite factory. Commissioned by Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, Holton Heath was the ideal location. Isolated, a good water supply, a railway and a local workforce. Today the site is an industrial park, but its original purpose is still apparent. John England worked here in the 1950s. This is the main laboratory and in behind these little buildings were for storage of chemicals which want to be kept out of the laboratory. Cordite is a mixture of nitroglycerin and gun cotton, drawn out in strands like spaghetti. Of the 2,000 who worked at the factory, around half were women. There were a lot of ladies coming on the trains and they got called the glamour puffers because <laughs> there were so many ladies on there. The girls who came here were given books about what to do and conditions of work, weren't they? they? Were. And one still survives, doesn't it? it? Is. What sort of things strike you about it? No matches or lighters. No which smoking. Is not so, no mm. smoking. And you've got to watch out for quite dangerous chemicals. This could be potentially extremely dangerous. Oh, yes, it could. They were laying out cordite onto benches and then they would have to cut it to length, probably still hot. Does it have any effect on them? It does, unfortunately, because nitroglycerin in there will absorb into the skin, and that will give you headaches, I'm afraid. In 1917, a problem threatened to stop production. A crucial ingredient, acetone, was being imported from America, but naval blockades in the Atlantic were stopping the supply ships. A Jewish chemist called Chaim Weizmann came forward with the answer, a new process to produce acetone in a brewery. These are fermentation vats, which will then produce the chemical you want, the acetone. Anything with starch in it would do the job. Maize was what he was working with. He did try potatoes, but people wanted to eat those. What was available in the autumn of 1917 was acorns, and even conkers were used. So who are the experts at collecting conkers? Well, school children, of course. Here at Lockyer School in Corf Mullen, the children are learning about their school's connection to World War I. And the proof of that connection is here in the school logbook, dated the 19th of October, 1917. In response to the suggestion from the Dorset Education Committee, many of the older children have volunteered to collect acorns and horse chestnuts for the Royal Naval Cordite Factory at Holton Heath. What happened to Heim Weizmann later in life? He became the first president of the State of Israel. There, look at that. When it came out of the factory, the cordite would go through Pearl Harbor and out into the channel. The cordite went by barge to the naval depot at Priddy's Hard in Gosport. This is now the Museum of Naval Firepower, where you can see what cordite actually looks like. The children have come here today, and it's going to take a big leap of the imagination to connect all of this with the conkers collected by their school in 1917. They put a shell in, they close the breach. Much can be learned inside the museum, but to see one of the exhibits, they have to go outside. Big guns were fired relentlessly throughout World War I, on land and at sea. People living in the south of England sometimes heard the thunderous barrage over in northern France. Luckily, such sounds are rare today, but I think this might be the first time that some of these children have heard a gun fire in front of them. Black powder substitutes for cordite here for safety reasons. Oh, 
imagine like, oh, I'm going to have to drop box that to my dad. <laughs> this is just one tiny element of a huge world war, but it shows the way that war reached into everyone's lives, whether they liked it or not. The scientists, the sailors, the women who made munitions all made their contribution, even children collecting vital conkers for cordite. A world at war led to great social change. With men away at the front, women stepped into many of the roles they'd left behind. The women of Blythe in Northumberland were among thousands who met that challenge, but their reputation as equal opportunity pioneers wasn't just one in the workplace. This story comes from Jerry Jackson of Look North in Newcastle. She was a miner's daughter, tall, strong, and only 17, and a goal-scoring phenomenon. Organised women's football had begun in the 1890s, but it wasn't until the Great War that their game became generally accepted. Times were changing fast. Women were taking on jobs vacated by men, and they were the vast majority of the munition workers supplying the front lines overseas. It was often hard physical work. Those with energy to spare began organising themselves into football teams. The best of them were Blythe Spartans ladies and their star centre forward, Bella Ray. Nearly a hundred years on, her granddaughter is walking in her footsteps. There was crowds of 10,000, sometimes 22, which was a lot of people in those years, you know. I mean, some of them don't get that now, do they? In one season, Bella's team were unbeaten in all their 30 games, and she scored 133 times. So on average, you know, when you're thinking it's at least three goals a game, isn't it, really? I don't think there was ever a game she played where she didn't score. <laughs> What would the atmosphere have been like at this ground during those days? Well, when you consider that the people were working very, very long hours, um, seven days a week often, with very little time off, there was nothing else in the way of release from them for, for, from the hard work that they were having to do. And suddenly to be able to come to what is, after all, a, a beautiful ground and see um, a proper match contested between two teams of women, um, it, was, it was unique. The matches drew ever bigger crowds, all raising funds for the war effort. For some people, there was the novelty of seeing women in shorts. For others, that was a minor scandal. But these women were a long way from your archetypal, genteel, delicate Edwardian ladies. Some of the language that could have been heard here was a bit um, industrial. But it wasn't just the language. They could be quite violent. I mean, kicking and hacking one's opponent was quite common among the girls and Bella herself commented on the fact that uh, she sometimes came up against uh, some big hard ladies and she had to give as good as she got. This helps explain why she was so successful. Though. It does indeed, yes. In 1918, Blythe beat all comers to win the North East Munitionettes Cup. Bella, naturally, scored a hat-trick in the final. One time when she was interviewed, she says, I, I was good, but I know I was good, you know? I knew I was good. So it, it's really nice to think that she was that good, you know? We've got a gold medal to prove that she played and all the, the bits and pieces that we've got. And it's really nice to think that you a little bit of history behind your family, isn't it? So Bella and her colleagues were pioneers and their exploits could have been a real springboard for women's football. Unfortunately, in 1921, the FA officially banned it. And that ban wasn't lifted until the 1970s. I mean, Bella herself uh, worked well into her 60s um, for a local farmer. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder if when she was working in the field, she, she cast her eye in the direction of Croft Park and, you know, heard faint echoes from the past of people shouting, away, Bella! And, imagined herself, you know, 17 years old again, crushing a fierce drive past a rather unfortunate visiting goalkeeper. <laughs> the First World War had a voracious appetite for new recruits, and if you were a man of God, then joining up meant a difficult decision. One such man was Bernard Van, who was chaplain at Wellingborough School in Northamptonshire. The Reverend Richard Coles, who presents Saturday Live on Radio 4, was also chaplain at Wellingborough. 
and BBC Look East asked him to reflect on his predecessor's choices. Lord, how many are my adversaries? Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say to my soul, there is no help for you in your God. Before the war to end all wars, Bernard Van was the chaplain at Wellingborough School, three miles from where I'm parish priest. He was born not far from here at Rushton and educated appropriately at Jesus College in Cambridge. So what turned this man of God into a man of war? How could he, a clergyman like me, live with what he did on the killing fields of France? I'm about to walk a while in his shoes to find out about Bernard Van. I'm in northern France by the banks of the St Quentin Canal with historian John Cooksey. We're trying to get a feel for what Van did here. Cloaked in fog, imagine it Richard. This is dense fog here. Van has got to get his men across this canal any way he can, drive them across, to drive them onto the high ground beyond and drive them back and break the Hindenburg line so he can get into open country beyond. This is where he won his Victoria Cross. On these fields he fought mortal hand-to-hand -hand combat. He could see the whites of their eyes as he took their lives. Germans aren't giving ground, and so it's very, very intense. It's very, very personal. Van can actually see he's there and he's actually killing. He's, at this point he becomes a killing machine. Revolver in one hand, riding crop in the other, shoots the, the, the Germans, hits them with a riding crop, and shows a marvellous example and drives the whole line forward. And for that, he gets the Victoria Cross. Van never got to receive his VC. Four days later, just weeks before the end of the war, he was killed here at Ramicourt by a German sniper. It was just before sunrise that he fell, shot through the heart. He would never return to Wellingborough, to his beloved wife, Doris. He would never see his son she was carrying. Just three miles away from where he fell is the British cemetery at Bellicourt, where I found his grave. According to his obituary, he never forgot that he was a priest of God. A great priest who in his days pleased God. In some ways I think I feel quite close to Bernard Van. We're both priests, we both come from the same place. But in other ways, I feel very distant from him. I can't imagine what it must have been like to have so heroically led his men in battle. But here, I think I feel close to him again, here in the cemetery as he lies alongside his fallen comrades. And it reminds us that in the end, we all come to the same place and beyond it, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. War brought change to people but it also brought change to buildings. In the case of one national landmark, war service was really just a continuation of its historic purpose. The Tower of London had been a prison and a place of execution for a thousand years. Now it could do its duty once more, as author and historian Len Sellers explained for BBC London. My dear ones, I have trusted God and he has decided. My hour has come. Tomorrow I shall be shot here in the tower. Those were the last words of the notorious German spy, Karl Hans Lodi, who was executed here in the Tower London on the morning of the 6th of November, 1914. His crime, spying. Lodi was the first man to be executed at the tower since 1743. The public were aghast that an enemy of the state had moved among them. For the country was already in the grips of war against Germany and Lodi had been sent to gather intelligence on the country's defences. On entering the country, the secret intelligence service, today's MI5, were already on Lodi's tail. He was captured and immediately faced trial. Lodi was found guilty and sentenced to death by firing squad. 
So it's here where the executions took place? Not in this carport, but this is the site. This is where the miniature rifle range was. And this is where Carl Lodi was brought on the morning of his execution and executed by firing squad. So Lodi was the first of 11 spies executed here? A total of 11 executions, nine of which were in this rifle range here and two were in the moat, which is more than the executions under Henry VIII within the walls of the tower. A grisly part of London's history, painstakingly kept at the National Archives. This lists all 11 of the prisoners which were executed in the tower. This is the file for Carl Frederick Muller. Oh, yes. We know that Muller uh, was tried for sending material that was used in invisible ink. And this is the letter with the secret writing. One can faintly see the text here. What One, did he use for invisible ink? Now it was said that the ink was made from, from a lemon. And here is the lemon. And this was uh, part of the evidence that was given in court and led to his execution. In all, 11 German spies were captured and executed at the tower. They had come to spy for Germany, but lost their lives by doing so. The IWM's Learning Centre is all about giving kids hands-on experience of history. And the World War I commemorations are, above all, about trying to convince today's generation that they can connect with events from their history books. And one item that's bound to hold their attention is the part played by animals. The story of War Horse captivated its audience, but other more exotic animals joined the war effort. Here's the story of one of them, told by Heidi Tomlinson from Look North in Leeds. Deployed to carry soldiers in the cavalry regiments and to pull artillery, ambulances and supply wagons, most horses in the Great War were sent to the Western Front. Lizzie the Elephant from Sedgwick's Menagerie filled in for absent horses in Sheffield. She was loaned to Wards, a scrap metal business, to pull carts of machinery around the city. So when the war was announced, fairs and circuses were closed all over the country and what happened the government requisitioned all the animals. So all the animals in circuses were put to the war effort. Most of the horses went to the front. So what they then did is requisition the circus animals, which were not actually in the war effort. Known as Lizzie Ward, the Indian elephant became a familiar sight on the cobbled Sheffield streets. This is the only footage of her pounding around, shackled to a weighty load with a bunch of onlookers in tow. During the war, Lizzie was based here at Castle House. It was opened by a vet in 1900 as a kind of multi-storey stables. Inside, there are low ramps to enable horses to get to the top level. It was the perfect home for a heavy, hard-working beast of burden. Stories about the tame, dependable elephant have passed down generations. Charlie Cook's dad frequently recounted tales of the legendary Lizzie. He came from a large family. There were, there were eight brothers. They used to come down, down to the main road. They used to follow the elephants up the road. and They used to actually throw things at it and chase after it until the guys that were, I suppose, the, the, the drivers would um, chase them off, usually with a stick, and if they caught them, give them a thick ear as well. My favourite story is that a traction engine got stuck and Lizzie pushed it out of the way. So that's quite a massive piece of kit for an elephant to push. So you got an idea of just how strong she was. 100 years ago, Lizzie was doing her bit for the war effort as much as any Sheffield person. In World War I, the image of a three-ton circus animal rubbing shoulders with pedestrians became routine. Lizzie Ward earned her place in Sheffield folklore. For the past half hour, we've given you a flavour of the stories which our teams around the UK have been tracking down. Some of those stories may be on your own doorstep. Some you'll be hearing and reading about as this centenary unfolds, perhaps via your local BBC television or radio, or via our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash WW1. For now, from the Imperial War Museum at Salford, goodbye.
la unidad. 